thank uh, Dr. Banshi Sabu for uh, his unique honor. I never dreamt that uh, one day I would be giving an oration in uh, late Dr. Opi Gupta's uh, name. As Dr. Vinod Kumar said, uh, I, I have not known uh, uh, Dr. Opi Gupta for 60 years, but uh, a little less than that maybe, because I, even as a medical student, uh, I knew uh, Professor Gupta because he's a very close friend of my father's. And we uh, like uh, the you know relationship he shared with Dr. Vinod Kumar. He had a very close uh, relationship uh, with me. He used to often call me and we used to speak. Uh, his erudition, his knowledge, the gentle, the gentle nature, na gentle but very firm nature, his commitment where he used to sit in the first row of every conference from the beginning of the conference till the end, which I don't see in medical students now. They, they only bunk. They only try to pretend that they attended a conference and a complete transformation from what Professor O.P. Gupta uh, represented is what we're seeing in present day medical students. I'm very sorry to say this, but across the country, across the world, I think that is the, the state of students, at least from India, I can talk. Uh, but he was a class apart. And as a researcher, uh, even in the 1960s and 70s, the kind of work that he did was uh, amazing. And of course, we have a lot of commonality, as Professor Vinod Kumar pointed out. So my pranams to this uh, great soul and the great work has been a total inspiration uh, to people like me who are, are much uh, younger. Of course, a brilliant diabetologist teacher and a great uh, mentor. It's very sad that we lost him. I've already thanked Dr. Banshi Sabu, but I have to thank both the chairpersons for the kind words of introduction, both Professor Vinod Kumar, with whom I'm having a lot of close interaction the last few years. And of course, Dr. Asha Shah, from, about whom I've heard a lot uh, from Dr. Banshi, who often keeps talking about you, madam. We've not had a chance to meet, and next time we should catch up in person. And to entire organizing committee of Diet Care Con, I was there for the inauguration today. And I know what a fantastic conference this has been, as hearing the previous session as well. In the interest of time, let me go on uh, to this presentation. Uh, so the topic of my presentation is precision diabetes care. How much of it has become a reality? Uh, today, precision medicine and precision diabetes is a big subject. In fact, I represent India on the American Diabetes Association EASD Precision Diabetes Initiative, PMI we call it. And uh, almost every week or every two weeks, uh, we are part of uh, a committee which is writing several uh, papers on this. And precision diabetes now includes uh, precision diagnosis, precision prevention, precision monitoring, precision treatment, precision prognosis. And we have separate subcommittees for type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, monogenic diabetes, and GDM. So you can imagine there are about 12 groups of people who are working on different, different uh, aspects of this. It's impossible to talk all about precision diabetes care, even if you give me two hours. So what I'll do is I'll quickly try to tell you some clinical aspects of where precision diabetes is going and what it's all about. I have no conflict of interest uh, to declare. So I'm just, just going to talk about two things. I'm not going to talk about type 1 diabetes or, uh, or GDM, although... This morning, Dr. Banshi Sabo and I have published a paper yesterday, actually, where we showed that people with type 1 diabetes can now live for 50, 60, 70 years. And in that paper, if you look at it, of course, the control of diabetes is better, hp is better, and uh, lipids were better. But if you see, not that they had their sugars under good control. So there is a group of people even within type 1 who will develop complications, others who will not. But we are studying all that. I'm not going to talk about that. Today, I'm just going to talk about some work which we have done on the clustering of type 2 diabetes because that's a novel area for us and some new information has come. And then I'll talk about two monogenic forms of diabetes, MODI and neonatal diabetes. Both of these cannot be diagnosed today without doing genetic testing. And this is where it's really become part of our clinical practice. So let me first start with clustering. The field of diabetes clustering actually took off only two, three years ago. We all knew that type 2 diabetes is not one disease. You can get somebody with the onset. I've had onset of diabetes at seven years of age, type 2 diabetic, fat child coming at seven years with type 2 diabetes. You can get type 2 diabetes coming at 85 years of age or 90 years of age. Both are obviously not the same genetic wise or anything. Similarly, obese diabetic, lean diabetic, and so many other different, mostly insulin resistant, mostly so many differences come in respect to treatment. Uh, you give, uh, you know, uh, just now we're discussing about 
uh, gentle infections or any other infection you give uh, metformin to somebody they'll develop diarrhea if you give it to somebody else 3 grams nothing happens to them there's a lot of pharmacogenomics and other uh, things but type 2 diabetes till now what we have been doing is we have been treating it now one size fits all okay so everyone type 2 diabetes first give metformin doesn't work then you give this that doesn't give give this. that is how we have been treating we have not been asking the question is type 2 diabetes one disease or, or one subtype or is it several subtypes this is a brilliant work from leaf group and colleagues who studied a scandinavian population and then using some uh, uh, i won't go into the bioinformatics k clustering they used bioinformatics through that they were able to using six variables they were able to divide the type 2 diabetes into five types but out of that five types one was really not type 2 diabetes it was lada or uh, said the uh, severe autoimmune diabetes which is what dr banshi sabu uh, worked on uh, under uh, dr asha uh, shah so that type is not really part of type 2 diabetes so that if you remove they had four types of uh, subtypes of diabetes so once this was announced all over the world we wanted to see whether the subtypes that they have said applies to our population not because we want to do me to research but because we believe that our diabetes is so different from the west and this we have known right from my days at the hammersmith hospital which dr vinod kumar mentioned right there we showed insulin resistance is different that is different this is different last 35 years we've been showing that so how can the clusters be the same across different populations so can the clusters described in canavia be applied to the asian indian population now here are 13 differences and there are many more which are different in indians compared to the west we have first of all the diabetes comes 10 to 15 years or 20 years earlier in our population compared to the west okay so what they get at 50 60 we get at 30s 20s and so on the increase insulin resistance is what i described my diabetology paper 1986 that was done at the royal postgraduate medical school and hammersmith hospital we also did clamp studies and showed that they are more insulin resistant when working there but then more recently some of these characteristics i don't have time to go through all of them but let me just harp on one of them number 5 if you see this characteristic dyslipidemia i would submit to you that i have not seen any other ethnic group in the world including chinese japanese and every other group that i have studied which has such a low hdl cholesterol so we have the lowest hdl cholesterol in the whole world period because so i have collaborated with scientists across the world nobody we have been able to see such low levels of hdl cholesterol and also high triglyceride so this is one of the most characteristic features of the diabetes the in indians and hdl and triglycerides are not included as criteria by leaf group so let me now go to that and tell you that this is a collaborative study that we did with the university of dundee scotland the entire study of course is done in india but they taught us this bioinformatics and this k clustering and so on and this is part of a study which we call as the inspired study or the india scotland partnership for precision medicine and diabetes in fact we set up a department of a precision diabetes some 5 6 years ago this is one of the earliest department in the world to be set up for precision diabetes and this all this funding comes from uk from the national institute of health research this is a paper which we published i'm going to talk about it's published in bmg open where we uh, the title of the paper is novel subgroups of type 2 diabetes and their association with microvascular outcomes in an asian indian population the data driven cluster analysis where did the patient population come from as was mentioned we have our clinics all over the country so it is and they are all linked by a common electronic records uh, and we have over 540000 patients in those records now so it is very easy to pick out these patients using the same criteria that leaf group had used uh, short duration of diabetes and typical type 2 diabetes we took out all the type 1s in our case we also took out the, those are gat positive because we feel that's a separate group and then we wanted to see whether the four groups that we got was the same as what they got and these are the uh, you know so to cut a long story short uh, they they had used the first uh, four age bmi waist and uh, hbmc they had used homa beta and homa ir uh, for assessing insulin resistance we had homa beta and homa ir 
but after seeing that their variables were not working in our population the same paper we described everything we said okay now we're going to switch it to ours and the most important i told you was hdl so we added hdl and triglyceride which made a big difference into the entire analysis because this is what brings out the the typical nature of the asian indian and of course for further studies we took c peptide because much simpler than doing homa beta and homa ir so fasting and simulated c peptide these were the eight now what are the results that we found we found four types of uh, type 2 diabetes two of which were similar but not the same as the uh, the, uh, the uh, scandinavian population one was called as the severe insulin resistant diabetes and that is what is shown here sid so we also had the sid but this sid was very different from their sid the other one which is similar to the west is what is called as mild age related diabetes or mard now their mard the mean age at, uh, at diagnosis was 65 years plus 67 or something our mard was 52 years what we call as old age related is 52 years so again this is completely different but at least it fitted in with what they had said the sid and the mard but then we found out two new types which they had not described at all one is called the insulin resistant obese diabetic and the other is called as a combined insulin resistant and deficient variety now this variety which we called as sird c i r d d combined insulin resistant deficient was actually uh, seen only in our population and i'll come to that now sid is young people thin people mostly insulin deficient irod is fat people mostly insulin resistant sird is a combination of both which has not been reported among the europeans and guess what they had the lowest hdl and the highest triglyceride and that is why they did not see it in their population and as i told you the mard also was much younger in our population now if you look at the clinical characteristics of these uh, of these four groups you'll understand what i'm trying to say look at the mean age at onset of the three groups 40 40 40 they didn't have anybody in their 40s they had all 60s and above one group i think they had 50s for us our old age related one is only 50 that was just touching 50 so we are completely different as far as the age structure is concerned now bmi and uh, and uh, waist and so on is the highest in the uh, resistant variety lowest in the uh, in the insulin deficient variety the insulin deficient variety is the most severe type you can see the hbmc is 10.7 and the next most uh, difficult to treat is the sird because they also have insulin deficiency but i would like to point your attention to the hdl look at the hdl in this population 40 38 42 you don't see this at all in the west they'll have 55 60 70 80 and so on for us 40 30 40 is what we get in all our patients but look at the sird it is 36 it is the lowest of all the four groups even more striking when you look at the triglycerides 140 150 you don't get these kind of triglycerides in the west you will get 100 120 you don't get 150 look at the sird variety it is 350 it is more than double of the other two types so this group is a unique group which is seen only in indians and i'm not going to go into this these people have the lowest uh, insulin secretion they have the highest insulin secretion the resistant variety and so on and so forth now despite this large number that we had in that study we had almost 20000 they had only 8000 in uh, in the whole study by uh, leaf group we had 20000 even then there's a small problem in our study and that is it's all taken from private centers all our centers are private so they are taken from a private center so how representative is that of india that's a very valid question luckily for us we work on the icmr india diabetes study or the icmr indiab study and there's a state of gujarat where dr banshi sabu was the principal investigator for gujarat and dr shashank joshi was the principal investigator for maharashtra along with dr yajnik like that we had uh, you know across india we had pis from all the states of india and this study has been completed it's the largest epidemiological study on diabetes ever done in the world 124000 people now from this indiab study which is totally representative of each state urban rural following the Uh, national family uh, health survey uh, guidelines for sampling we had done that so we had newly diagnosed uh, diabetic patients following the same from 15 states at that time which we had completed now all the 30 are completed we had these samples then so we said let us try to replicate it whether in the true indian sample representative of india we are able to get the same four subtypes now what we did was 
Now, it's very difficult to do C peptide in the whole country in an epidemiological study. Government won't pay for it. So, we took all the other characteristics, HDL, triglycerides, waste, and so on. We just left out C peptide and said, let's see without, without C peptide whether we can uh, get the same clusters. And the good news was that we got exactly the same clusters. Just to remind you, which one was the one which had the lowest HDL? I told you it's a third variety. Look at it here, it's 31. In India, the HDL levels are even lower because they belong to rural areas and so on. So when you come to that, but the same pattern, still the same lowest HDL in the third variety. Look at the triglyceride, 414. These triglycerides in the rest of the country is even higher because our patients are probably treated. So you can see 180, 180, 150 and 400. So we are able to exactly replicate what we got in India uh, from the clinic sample. We are able to replicate it. More recently, again, when the collaboration with Dr. Banshi Sabu, Dr. Jyoti, uh, Jyoti Dev and others, we have done a third replication in another paper, which has just got published in Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics. And for the third time, we have replicated it. So there's no doubt. And these are all from private clinics from all over India. Again, we were able to replicate it. Now, what is the clinical relevance of all this clustering? What has this to do with precision diabetes? Now, if you look at it, and this is what Leaf Group also showed, and we agree with them, that what they showed was the insulin deficient variety is more prone to retinopathy. And we've got the same results here. Okay. And they said the insulin resistant variety is not more prone to retinopathy. We found that also. But we added something here. You know, the third variety where there is insulin deficiency also, they are more prone to retinopathy because they have insulin deficiency. So this is something new to the world literature that we added. Now, if you look at nephropathy and chronic kidney disease, they are more seen in the insulin resistant variety. And that's exactly what we found. In the SID variety, it is not significant, whereas in the IROD variety, it is more significant. So this group is more prone to nephropathy and CKD. Okay. But again, the surprising thing was because these people have insulin resistance, the third variety, they are more prone to nephropathy also. So what is the conclusion? The third variety is more prone to both retinopathy and nephropathy, whereas the thin insulin deficient ones are only more prone. Uh, to uh, retinopathy and the fat ones, the IROD ones are more prone to nephropathy. So this is a new finding that we found. One more thing that we saw was how much time did it take for the HbA1c to get under control? The easiest to get under control was the MARD variety. They had very mild diabetes. So they got easily under control. This is a percentage of people who got A1c uh, below 7%. The most difficult, as you would imagine, is the SID variety, the insulin deficient variety. And guess what? which is the next most difficult to treat. It's a third variety because they have a combined defect plus they have insulin deficiency. So these two are the most difficult. Now we know why some patients easily get under control and others don't get under control. Till the studies were done, we were, oh, this fellow is lucky. His karma was like that. This was like that. Now it's not karma. We know it's based on the physiology that it happens. So we are able to get more such details. So I'm going to stop there. We have done much more work now. We are now looking at the uh, response to drugs and that is being published. Now we are doing an RCT, taking the four groups and then trying out different drugs, SGLT2 versus DPP4 versus insulin versus. So that's all a different uh, thing. At the next meeting, maybe uh, I'll come back and show you more data. I'm going to move on in the interest of time. It's still a work in progress, but we are definitely seeing a complete change in the way we are looking at type 2 diabetes now as compared to say even two or three years ago. Now let me come to something more dramatic. This is monogenic forms of diabetes. Monogenic forms of diabetes is where there is a single gene mutation. In type 2 diabetes, it's a polygenic disease. There are so many genes affected. There is environmental factors. In monogenic, there's only one gene which is mutated and that produces diabetes. Now, there are different types of monogenic diabetes. We have got about eight to 10 types of monogenic. I'm not going to talk about all that. I'm going to talk about only two types, MODI, maturity onset diabetes of the young, and neonatal diabetes, which is onset below six months of age. MODI itself is of 14 types. Once you do the genetic typing, you have MODI 1, MODI 2, MODI 3, MODI 4. Each one is a different chromosome. Each one has a different clinical pattern, and each one responds differently to drugs. For example, MODI 2 doesn't need any drugs to treat, just diet alone is enough. MODI 1 and 3 respond to sulfonylureas. MODI 4 and 6 don't respond to sulfonylureas. MODI 5 also. 
and so on and so forth. Modi 12 response to sulfonyl ureas. So we are beginning to understand all of this. In many of these things, we have one of the largest experience now because we've been collecting large series of Modi. But what? why bother about all this as a clinician? Esoteric ivory tower research that we are doing to publish a paper? No. This is because it influences the lives of children with diabetes. Now, this is a 16-year-old girl. She was thin, presented with severe diabetes. HP1C is 10.4. Because of the young age at onset, she was straight away diagnosed to have type 1 diabetes and said, take three times insulin per day for life. They came running to us, as many type 1s do, and said, is there anything else that you can do? Now, the first thing, for, we follow algorithms when we treat at our center. Everything is systematic. First thing we do is to draw a family history. When we do the family history, that's the girl there, the proband. We found a mother had diabetes, several aunts had diabetes, one of the aunt's children, her cousin had diabetes, and the grandmother and the grandfather and great-grandfather, they all had diabetes. Now, this type of inheritance is called as autosomal dominant inheritance. It is classical of Modi. You very rarely see this in type 1 diabetes. Okay, But we didn't stop with that. We then did the next step, we did C-peptide. In type 1, it will be absent. Here it was present, fairly good reserve. Then we went on to do the GAD antibodies and zinc transporter. Both were negative. So with this, we said, oh, with this three-generation transmission, we need to do genetic testing. We don't do genetic testing in everyone. Only if the clinical algorithm suggests it, only in a small number of people, we do genetic testing. Incidentally, just yesterday, I rang up Dr. Banshi Sabu to tell him that one of his cases had Modi 3. And he was so excited uh, because one of his cases turned out to be Modi 3. Now we're going to study the whole family. So that's exactly what we did, Banshi, with this family. After we detected that uh, this uh, girl had uh, type, I mean, Modi, we took all the diabetic members in the family and tested them for Modi 3. And we found that uh, not only she had Modi 3, but all the family, all the red shown here are diabetic people. By that time, she had a sister who was one or two years younger to her. She developed diabetes and she also had the same Modi 3. Now, guess what? This Modi 3 is a type of diabetes that responds to sulfonylureas, an arginine histidine mutation. So what we did was we took the patient off insulin, started on sulfonylurea, glybenthlamide, the cheapest of sulfonylureas. She showed excellent response. A1C came down to 6.8%. Now it's about 15 years since she came to us and she and her sister are still responding to sulfonylurea. If not, she had not come to us. She would have been still on insulin three times a day saying that she has type 1 diabetes. So we were able to completely stop the insulin and change the course of this girl's life because of genetic testing. And this is a classical example of precision diabetes because if you follow the precision diabetes formula, you will be able to, it's like mathematics, you'll be able to sort out your patients very well. We went on to publish on Modi 3 and uh, Modi 1 and Modi 2 and Modi 5. And we have several more publications uh, coming up on Modi. All these 10 to 12 papers have come on Modi. Let me now pass on, if you thought that was exciting, wait till you hear about an even more dramatic instance, and that is neonatal diabetes. These are newborn children just diagnosed to have diabetes. One month old, 10 days old, three months old, usually before six months of age. There are two types of neonatal diabetes. The first is called the transient variety or TNDM, which disappears by the first birthday. By the time child becomes one year old, the diabetes goes away because that has a particular type of mutation. But the more common one is the permanent neonatal diabetes, which will persist. Now, the transient neonatal diabetes sometimes can come back in adolescence. I've seen that. But for next 10, 15 years, they may not have diabetes. Sometimes it will come back. Permanent neonatal diabetes will continue. Throughout, it will continue. And that is much more common in India. Let me again illustrate it with a case. Then it will make it interesting. A 72-day-old, 72 days old, that means just more than two months old, this baby from Calcutta was diagnosed to have diabetes, again diagnosed to have type 1 diabetes, started on insulin, and but she's not coming down. 14 units, the 72-day-old child is taking, and the blood sugars remaining between 300 to 400. So she was referred to a center, what is wrong with this child? Please look at the child. So when we, considering that she had, now it's mandatory, anybody below six months of age has to do genetic testing. So we sent the child for genetic testing. That's a sequencing machine which we use. And what we found was this mutation. Normally, the band will come like this. Electrophorotogram will come like this. You have a GG there. This child had a GT. And instead of the CC, she had a CA. Both in the forward strand and the reverse strand, we were able to pick it up. So this is a classical mutation 
which has found the KCNJ11 gene. Now, this mutation responds to sulfonylurea. So, what we did was, after finding this mutation, we uh, started the child on glibenclamide and slowly the dose of insulin was withdrawn in the hospital. You can see that the, what is shown here is a sulfonylurea dose. Slowly, we stepped up the sulfonylurea dose. What is shown in red is the insulin dose. And you can see the insulin coming down, down, down. By day four, it's come down to zero, no insulin. And now the blood sugars with insulin, no response. And after starting the sulfonylurea and increasing it, you can see the blood sugars settling down beautifully. Okay. So you may ask, in fact, just now I had another call desperately. I think it's from Ahmedabad only. One uh, uh, patient uh, sent the blood yesterday. And now they're saying, tell us what to do. Tell us what to do. I said, I can't tell you what to do until we get the genetic testing. Give us two, three weeks time. These things take time. We have to find out what it is. And the father is so desperate. Tell us, tell us, tell us. You want to start tablet for the child. I said, you have to wait. Or ask your physician. They still want to start self -nilary. You can start. But only 50% have the mutation. And if you start it in others, it is dangerous. The child can die. So be careful. Okay. So, But this is a classical example of that. So what happens is... Oops. Is that... Okay, so one more uh, case before I stop. A three-year-old female baby, again from West Bengal, born of non-consanguinous marriage. Now, although she was on insulin, uh, they told us when took the history that she got it into six months old. I said, oh, six months. Okay, maybe neonatal diabetes. Let us see. So we, uh, we uh, this is her blood sugar. She was responding somewhat, uh, not uh, fully not responding. She was on small dose of pre-mixed insulin, three units and two units. Remember, she's only three years old. Uh, GAD antibody is negative. C-peptide was uh, not very good. So we carried out the genetic testing. Now, in this case, we found that the, the mutation was in the ABCC8 gene. This is the sulfonylurea receptor gene. You can see that this is the mutation here, and that is the mutation there. So this particular mutation was found in the ABCC8 gene. And this is another gene. If you have the mutation, they respond to sulfonylurea. So what happened was with insulin, her blood sugars was 138 and 180. After switching over to glibenclamide, uh, after the first week, it became 86 and 154 and uh, before lunch. And then after six months, it was 92 and 133. And HbA1c also came down. And therefore, we com completely switched over this child from insulin to uh, self malaria. The first report we published in 2012, that time we had only 33 cases of neonatal diabetes. The next report was published this year. We had 181 patients, of which in 39, we found the mutation. They come to us from all over the country. And this is just to show you that when you have this particular mutation, the, these are seven patients with seven different mutations in this particular gene. And you can see that they respond differently. You can see the blood sugars are different. In some, it goes to 1,000 milligrams. In some, it's only 250 milligrams, depending on the mutation. So now we know which mutation produces which blood sugar response. But you can see that they all responded to self -nilurias. And you can see that first year, second year, third year, fourth year, they are still maintaining excellent control. They respond beautifully. If this is one gene, this is another gene. The other one is KCNJ. This is ABCC8. Again, uh, five different, six different patients showing six different responses of, uh, as far as blood sugar is concerned. But at the moment we started the uh, glibenclamide, you can see that they have responded beautifully. So whether it's KCNJ11 or ABCC8, they respond beautifully to sulfonylurea treatment. Today, we have 477 such patients, of which 274 are neonatal diabetics. 51 are genetic syndromes. Sometimes they come to us we find that they have walcott rollison syndrome or Didmode syndrome or uh, thiamine responsive megaloblastic anemia or different other types of syndromes. Each syndrome has its own prognosis, has its own clinical course. So today we can say this child will live up to so many years. This child, no problem. She will be okay or he'll be okay. All that we are able to say thanks to uh, genetic testing. And also we have an equal number of cases now coming up with congenital hypoglycemia. Look at the genes, the same genes. KCNJ, KCNJ, ABCC, ABC, insulin gene, insulin gene. Same genes. Only thing is, one, you have gain of function, one, you have loss of function. If you have gain of function, you will develop hypoglycemia. If you have loss of function, you will develop neonatal diabetes. Now, these cases of hypoglycemia, some of them respond to disoxide. We are able to say if they have this mutation, you will respond to disoxide. If you have this mutation, you will not respond to di disoxide, you should try octreotide. And if you have another mutation, both won't respond, you have to go for pancreatectomy. Or to that extent, today we are able to go after based on the mutation. 
with all humility i'd like to add there are only two three labs in the whole world which do this and we are one of that lab we are the only one in india which does it and of course it creates a lot of news because you're completely changing the life of a child when you treat like this and that's what precision diabetes is all about today we're getting samples from all over the country we become a nodal center for this and therefore from all over the country regularly every day we'll get at least one or two samples uh, coming in either for modi or neonatal diabetes or hypoglycemia we even started a registry it's called monogenic diabetes registry of india we want to register every case in the country and I take the help of uh, banshi and all of you all in your own state to collect all the cases of uh, neonatal diabetes and modi and bring them into one registry so that people can uh, see them so i'd like to conclude ladies and gentlemen by saying that precision diabetes slowly coming of age and it can be applied to all forms of diabetes with respect to type 2 diabetes we have now made definite inroads to say that there are four different clusters two of which are the same as a scandinavian cluster uh, that's a sid and the mard two are unique which we have described uh, the irod variety and the surd variety study of monogenic diabetes helped to help many children uh, with neonatal diabetes and youth with modi to go off insulin completely and transform their whole life and precision diagnosis can help to offer precision treatment and thereby improve the quality of life uh, these are only humble small steps that we have made and we have still long way to go but we believe that we are in the right direction and uh, we can definitely make a difference uh, to uh, hundreds if not thousands of people's lives with the uh, diabetes i'll now stop there of course all children before the age of 6 months must undergo genetic testing you heard of any child in india we'll do it free of cost for you don't worry we not not one rupee we are interested in is purely a service to the nation which i would like to offer on gandhi jayanti day i'm sure our father nation would have liked it this is not commercial at all so just send it to us we'll do it free of cost for you many of them are able to stop insulin novel mutation neonatal diabetes have been found and if you find abcc8 and kcnj 11 mutations you can transfer them to self malurias and i would again humbly submit that this is a kind of miracle of sorts as far as the child and the family is concerned this is my team at our siriseri research uh, center is a 40000 square foot uh, center one of the largest in asia uh, where we have a full genetic setup now and uh, dr radha venkateshan is a head and all these people 100 publications and 13 phd's have come out of this work just on the genomics of uh, diabetes and with that i'd like to once again thank dr banshi sabu 